Joining me now is head coach for the Southeast Missouri State Red Hawks, Brad Korn. Brad, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day and talking to me. And how's it going, my man? I uh, appreciate it, Peyton. It, it, everything's going well. It's been a uh, obviously a whirlwind for us and everything after Saturday. But uh, these are all really, really good problems to have. Oh, yeah, 100%. You mentioned Saturday. I want to get into that. OVC champs. Me and my brother Josh, we were at that game in Evansville. And, man, it was only like 1,700 people there. But, boy, it felt like there was over like 5,000 people there because the atmosphere was electric. It was loud. And we'll get to those final moments in regulation and get into the overtime period. But first, I want to ask you, 2000 was the last tournament appearance for this program. How does it feel knowing you helped in this long drought of not making it to the big dance? Yeah, obviously, when you when you talk about it and put those uh, kind of years on it and the, just the drought and everything that we did when we got here, uh, just uh, taking over during a pandemic. And then the year after that, Peyton is the the portal. And it just is kind of like, man, when are we ever going to be able to get our head up here? I know we're doing the right things, but you kind of need you need some verification along the way. And obviously, this is a major way to get that verification going to the NCAA tournament. But uh, really just the, the amount of text messages and the amount of people reaching out and happy for you, like genuinely happy for you uh, and happy for the program and the people in this community, this region, uh, they needed it. They understand basketball. They wanted to see um, our place do well. And, and now to be able to give that to to people is something really, really remarkable. And to say that you had a, a hand in that and, um, I, you know, to, to see the look on our, our players' faces after winning that championship and then just to see the – and to have the embraces with the the assistant coaches and the families and just there's so much that goes into it and I never take it for granted and it just feels a little bit sweeter doing it at a at a place like this that didn't have maybe that um, history that had that had been there at other places and, and schools that I've been at that have gone to the tournament before. Absolutely, you mentioned the look on your players' faces. You can tell. Uh, it meant a lot to them to help uh, win this game. You know, me and my brother stayed after for about 30 minutes and just watched you guys celebrate, cut the nets down, take the pictures and stuff. And you can just tell, you can just look in their eyes like this meant a whole lot to them. And me and my brother talked about before the game started and stuff that I want to transition to asking you about. Uh, before the game started, just watching pregame, your bench or your team was uh, warming up right in front of us. And we could just sense, like, your guys were locked in from the beginning. And it, you can, it could tell because you started the game. I think you guys were up, like, 7-0. You jumped them early. Yeah. Could you sense that your team was that locked in before the game even started? Yeah, really, uh, really on Tuesday night, you know, before we left, we said, we just told the guys, like, hey, look, guys, if you don't think that we can win – four games in four days, don't get on the bus. If you're not going to pack for four days, don't get on the bus. And, um, you know, from Tuesday night when we met with them all the way through the weekend up until Friday night, they just, to your point, they just had a calmness about them. They had a, a, a really a steely look in their eyes. They just, nothing was going to be too big. Nothing was going to be too small. And we just, we just went out there very even keeled and very businesslike. And, and that's how we approached it. You know, we got, we got down, we got up, we didn't, uh, a lot of highs and lows. That last game was was dramatic and we just didn't, we never really lost our way. So uh, again, our, our guys, the, the short answer is yes. I, I felt that from our guys. They were very, very uh, business-like in their approach the whole weekend. A couple of your guys I want to ask about is Philip Russell, who's your leading scorer. He's averaging about 18 points per game. I think he's second in the OVC uh, for scoring-wise. And Chris Harris, who's named the MOP of the tournament. When you have two guards like that who can both get you buckets at any time, how much better does that make your team? It's just – it's like when you have uh, – you know, this is a guard lead. Ba college basketball, you have to have good guard play. And we have two of the best in the conference. And when you have guys like that that they can go and you know Chris and Phil both can go make a play, they can they can get themselves a shot late in shot clock, and they can set up others late in shot clock. It makes my job a lot easier. I get to stand there and just watch them half the time because they are that talented and that good with the ball in their hands. And they're they're just three level guys. You know, Chris did a lot of his damage inside the arc, uh, and so now when you can make defenses shift and account for you all over the floor, you know, people just can't load up on you and, and feel the same way. Uh, you know, those guys get a lot of attention and, and rightfully so because their game, you know, speaks volumes. There's not a whole lot you can do. They're not like one of those players that you can force them left and take them out of the game. You can't say, well, don't guard him. He can't shoot. They can't say, well, force him left because he can't go left. There really is not a whole lot of flaws in their game. So those two guys obviously, you know, spearhead a lot of what we do. 
the biggest thing I noticed about Philip Russell, and I've been watching him all season long, and I just mentioned he is averaging like 18.1 points per game. He leads you guys in scoring. But in this game specifically, he was the second leading scorer. Chris Harris is actually the one who led you in scoring in this one with 26 points. How important is it when your best player and your best or your leading scorer is willing to give the ball up when he's not really particularly scoring the ball well? Yeah, and again, it's you. Like I said before, you can't just zero in. You know, and Phil's a great player. You know what I mean? Don't get me wrong. First team all league. Chris was second team all league. Um, but when you have two guys out there, it's like you can't just key in on Philip Russell and take him out the game and then you're going to win. Uh, Israel Barnes stepped up and played huge. And Chris, I thought that what Phil and Chris did is they were like a yin and yang. They were a tag team approach. You know, when it wasn't going well for Phil or he wasn't shooting it well or he had foul trouble. Chris carried the load. And then when Chris got a little bit tired, Phil came back in and, and closed some games for us. And then guys like Israel Barnes were just so rock solid on both sides of the ball for four straight games. Josh Early has a double-double against Tennessee State. Evan Ursher came in and gave us a huge game. I can't remember if it was Lindenwood or Tennessee State. So you got to have a balance of that all throughout if you're going to win a championship in four games in four days. And so um, I thought Chris and Phil did a great job of just tag teaming and each guy taking their turn. And, uh, and then another guy's just stepping up and being very, very consistent. I mentioned it at the beginning of the interview, and I want to talk about it now. You guys ended up winning this game 89-82, but you had to go in overtime to do it. Talk to me about the final a minute 11 in regulation when you guys were up 72-65 and nearly got beaten the buzzard. When that Deontay Wood shot went in, did you think your season was over like most of us thought that was there? Actually, I'm, I'm the one guy I think in all of – in the whole building that didn't think that it was over. Cause when he caught the ball, I could see that he was well within the, the three point line. It's when he pivoted that he became outside of it. And I didn't really recognize it at first until I saw the monitor. And then I was like, Oh boy, this thing could be over. Uh, but uh, so I initially, you know, the first 10, 15 seconds, I was trying to get the guys back over to the huddle. Cause I was like, Hey, as bad as this is, um, you know, we still got to go to overtime. Like we got five more minutes. We almost gave this game away, but we've got five more minutes to win it. And uh, until I saw the monitor, that's when my heart kind of dropped and was like, man, you know, surely this is not how the, our season is going to end. What was the reactions for some of your players? Because that shot literally happened right in front of us. I posted a video on our Twitter and our Facebook group of it. And I didn't, when the shot went up, none of us was really paying attention if his foot was on the line or not until right. the refs came and uh, looked at the monitor. And then we all found out that it was going into overtime. But what was the emotions of your players like going back to the bench after that? Well, uh, you know, they all thought it was a three. So a couple guys were even crying and everyone else is angry because we didn't execute down the stretch. So we feel like we've just given up an, uh, an opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, but in that moment, you know, once they ruled it was a two, Dylan Branson uh, took a, a great leadership role opportunity and just said, hey, the way we feel right now, we've got five more minutes to never have to feel that way again. Let's go win this game. And uh, then Phil or Chris stood up and then he started saying stuff and, um, so give them, give Dylan Branson a ton of credit for just taking, you know, stepping up in that moment and getting our minds back focused on what the task was, even after the, um, you know, the, the somewhat of the, the letdown of the moment. You talk about never letting your uh, heads get down after that. And you guys were up 72, 65. They hit a shot that originally that most people thought that ended the game and ended your season. You can tell you said that some of your players were crying. They were emotional. And it ends up going to overtime. You guys start the overtime period down, I think, 80 to 76. You went down pretty early in the overtime with like two minutes to go. And then yeah. you fought and scratched your way back and ended up winning this game by seven. How important is it for your team to stay connected and how um, impressed were you that your team not only stayed connected but they were so poised in the moment after going down four yeah well I guess initially I would think if we would have played like or had that same mindset when we were up seven we never would have been in that position but again you give you give Tennessee Tech a ton of credit I mean they had to hit some unbelievable shots to make that happen um, and they did but our guys were just the resiliency of the of our guys the toughness understanding what's at stake, not letting um, a bad moment turn into a bad game and not letting one bad moment turn into three and four bad moments uh, and really just having the resolve and the toughness. I mentioned Israel Barnes, we're down four and he drives baseline and gets an and one. Uh, now that you go from down four to only down one, well, now that's a, you know, now you're talking possession basketball with two and a half minutes left. Anything can happen. Uh, and so that was the spark that we needed. We needed to just hang in there long enough. We needed something positive to happen. And Israel provided that, but all of our guys just staying connected and staying with one another. Uh, if that doesn't happen, you never get to see it through to the end. 
Last question for you, Coach. Selection Sunday is this Sunday. What's the plans for you guys? Like, you guys going to get together? You guys going to watch? Like, what's the plans for y'all? Because it's a big moment for you guys. Yeah, it's a huge moment for our university, a huge moment for our region, our town, our program, everybody. So we're going to uh, – our show-me center is where we play our games, and we're going to have – we opened it up. Uh, doors are going to open at 4 o'clock. We're going to introduce the team at 440. The selection show starts at 5 o'clock, and we're going to turn this thing into a, a watch party with the whole community. Uh, it's something that we've tried to do since we got here is to bridge the the gap between the community and the program. And again, this is a small knit community. It's an area that loves basketball. And to me, we need it. We need everybody. This needs to be a party. We need to celebrate this. And so I think the the Cape Girardeau area and surrounding areas will come out and support this team and, and take part in what's going to be a uh, should be a pretty magical and special day on Sunday. Hell yeah. I love to hear it, man. Love, I'm excited to watch Selection Sunday to see what you guys get, uh, what region and bracket you guys are selected in. Congratulations, Coach. Big moment for you guys and big moment for your program and your fans. Hell of a win, and we wish you the best of luck going forward in the tournament, man. I, I appreciate it, Peyton. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you so much for joining on. There you guys have it. Brad Korn from Southeast Missouri State Redhawks.